As you've just heard, my wife and I are the parents of six children. If you look closely at the screen, you'll also note something interesting about my family, and that is that my six children are all daughters. I get that response a lot. Uh, some of you may have some of those questions in your mind that you're not really supposed to ask, but you kind of do anyway. Uh, yes, we did intentionally conceive all six of them. No, we're not trying for a boy, and we never were. We, we think girls are wonderful, and we're grateful to have six of them most of the time. A and um, yes, our family does all live together in the same house, and we actually usually get along <laughs> reasonably well sometimes, most of the time. Uh, and for those of you who are curious about whether or not we have a television, no, we don't. I'm just kidding, we do. We just don't, <laughs> we just don't watch it very much, obviously. Uh, you can see as well that they, they range in age quite a, a lot. We've had them across three decades. Our, our eldest daughter was born in the 90s. She's now 17, and our youngest is just two years old. And we're crazy about them. Now, the more that I've studied, the more I've come to realize that parenting provides powerful lessons in life and in leadership for all of us. And today, I'm going to share three of those with you. So this is my youngest, this is Emily, Emily Eden, and around about a year ago when this was taken, she was just over a year old, and I was looking after the children one afternoon, she woke up from her nap, and I could tell that she needed me, she was calling out for me, and so I entered her room, and anyone who's a parent knows the feeling, you know, you walk into your child's room, and they look at you, and they smile like you are the most important person in the world, and you are. And as I entered the room, she smiled at me, and I thought, oh, how good is this? She held out her hand as if she wanted to give me something. And, and I immediately, being the overprotective parent that I am, hypervigilant, I, I, I walked over to the cot and I said, Tart today, I was thinking maybe there's something sharp or dangerous or poisonous that she has in her hand and I need to get it off. And not that we, not that we let our children sleep with sharp, poisonous, dangerous things. <laughs> <laughs> but you just never know what they might have in their hands. And so I said, Tata Daddy. And she smiled as she placed into my hand a nugget of poo. <laughs> that she must have, I don't know, pulled out of a nappy just before I walked into the room a few moments prior. And I remember looking at her and saying something like this. I said, Emily, it looks like you need my help. I'm so glad I got here when I did. Because if you've seen anything on YouTube or Google Images about what kids can do with that stuff if you leave them alone, you know why I was tremendously pleased that I got there when I did. And I started to clean her up, and it occurred to me that there was a remarkable life lesson here, a remarkable leadership lesson. See, every single one of us has some form of a, a stewardship over the people that we look after, whether they're children or whether they're a team or in our business or wherever it might be. And, and every now and again, those people will give us shh shockingly unexpected <laughs> treats. You thought I was going to say something. I don't know, you know, hmm. They're going to give us this stuff that we don't really want to have to hold. They'll just give us some unwanted output. Uh, <laughs> if you'll excuse the euphemism. And we have a choice at that point. We, we get to decide, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to fling it back at them? L literally start metaphorically flinging crap around the room? What are you giving me this for? Or am I going to sort of roll over and take it and say, well, you know, if that's the best that you've got, well, I'll just keep on cleaning up after you and I'm sure it'll work itself out one day. Or is there another alternative? Obviously there is, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here with you just now. Um, research, curiously, tells us that when people become increasingly powerful and increasingly influential, they possess a, a set of skills, or not even skills, more attributes or characteristics that help them to, to get there, to become powerful and influential. And that list of attributes is, includes things like uh, empathy and social and emotional awareness and understanding and responsiveness, and perhaps most importantly, a great desire to help. Now, paradoxic, American politics aside, of course, um, parado <coughs> paradoxically, um, when they attain that higher level of power and status and, and influence, the research also indicates that they often dismiss those attributes that literally turn them into pied pipers and had people following them. And there's a few reasons that that might happen. Some of them are a little bit crass, like, well, look at me, I'm the leader now, the power and the prestige, I can do what I want, uh, just follow me. Or I've got to put my game face on. This is just how it has to be now because I'm the boss. But I think that there are a few other subtle reasons. Uh, one of them is just, it, once upon a time I was a follower and I followed and I followed well, but now I'm a leader and I've got the vision, just follow me, just get in line, I know where I'm going. Or perhaps it's more aligned with 
I've just got so much stuff to do. And I'm so busy and I'm trying to cope with it all and there's not very much margin. And and we forget that the people that we're leading are people. So in my early 20s, I was a a radio announcer. I loved my job. But we just had our first baby, obviously a little girl. And... um, (laughs) obviously, and, and, and I was, well, well she, was, she was quite sick and I was sleep deprived because she was sleep deprived and my wife was sleep deprived and I was staying up in sympathy with them. And, and, and you know, when you turn on the radio, radio announcers sound happy to be there and I was and I was exhausted and the inevitable occurred and I was called into the boss's office and he sat me down and we stared at each other across the desk and he started to mention that he'd noticed my performance slippage. And I braced myself for it. I was waiting for the, um, Justin, here's your warning. It's time to pick up your game. Or, Justin, you know, we've we've worked with you for a while, but it's not working out. Thanks for being here. You need to try something new, something different. And as I sat there waiting, my boss looked at me and he said, we've noticed that things aren't going so well for you lately. I didn't offer much in the way of excuses. I didn't have much to say. He leant forward and he looked me in the eyes and he said, Justin, what can I do to help? It seems like you could do with it right now. Now, had he done what so many bosses that we've probably all worked with, or parents, mind you, that we've all been, and started, you know, he could have started flinging my crap back at me and said, this is not good enough and I'm going to give you a whole lot more as well. And had he done that, as so many leaders and people in charge do, I would have left that office feeling disempowered. I would have left the office feeling disgruntled. And I probably would have even left the office feeling passive aggressive. But instead, I walked out of that office willing to walk across hot coals for Paul Sweeney, if he asked me to. I'd been handing him large quantities of unwanted output, and he just asked me how he could help. Now, we'll wash our hands of this metaphor momentarily. I'm so glad you like that. I worked hard on that line, let me tell you. I can use it in Melbourne tomorrow as well. That's good. (laughs) But but first, the, the, the key lesson. The best leaders know that we use our power best by not using it at all. We demonstrate our influence most by not trying to be influential. As a polemic writer, one of my favourites by the name of Alfie Cohn says, it's not about doing things to people, it's about working with them. And I would add, and for them. Now the second principle that I want to share with you, or the second story I guess that I'd like to share with you, we're going to go to the end of the, the other end of the the, the children's scale, I'm going to share a story about my eldest daughter. This is Chanel, uh, with a couple of her friends in in our kitchen goofing off, and Chanel's just turned 17, but just before she got her peas and drove out of the RTA car park without me, in a car on her own, that was an experience, let me tell you. But that's a story for another day. Just before she did that, I was driving to work with her. She was on her way to the chicken and chip shop that she works at. And I could tell as she drove that she was not happy. It might have been the way that she revved through the six gears on her way to top speed in the 60 zone. And, and, and she just wasn't happy. And, and I commented. I said, Chanel, you seem like you're unhappy. And she rolled her eyes. And I said, I get a sense that you're unhappy with me. And she said, yes, Dad, I am. And I said, I'm so glad that you've told me that. Could you tell me why? She said, well, sure. Today I found out that two weeks ago, all of my friends had a party and they didn't invite me and I only just found out about it today. And when I asked them why they didn't invite me, they said, well, because it was the kind of party that Dr. Justin Coulson wouldn't have approved of. (sighs) And for those of you for whom the penny didn't drop, I'm Dr. Justin Coulson. (laughs) And straight away I felt so bad for her. I thought, oh my goodness, my... My parenting is causing my daughter to be ostracized and isolated and to feel horrible and to miss out on opportunities to be with her friends. But do I want her to have those opportunities? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, you know, if they didn't invite you to a party that I wouldn't approve of, it sounds like there probably were a few things going on that are not consistent with our values. Uh, was there alcohol being consumed and potentially misused? She said, yes. I said, were there other drugs being consumed and potentially misused? She said, almost certainly. I said, were people disappearing into rooms for intimate encounters that they may or may not regret the next day? She said, possibly. I said, well, I'm really glad you weren't there. Do we need to revisit the rules? Do we need to talk about why the rules are there so that you understand very clearly why? And she said, Dad, I know the rules. 
See, over the last 10 or 12 years or thereabouts, what, what we do with our kids is we preemptively pre-arm them. So as they go into grade three, we say, guess what, you're going into grade three and how exciting and all these things to look forward to. Oh, but by the way, you'll probably find that the kids are going to start swearing and that's not consistent with what we do at home and we'd like you to even not do it elsewhere. And you're going into grade five, you know, the kids are probably going to start looking at pornography. I know, I'm so sorry. Anyone who doesn't have a child in year five yet, pre-arm them. And then year seven... <laughs> Uh, we talk about alcohol, and year eight, we talk about other drugs, and you know, we talk about... Se- you get the picture. <laughs> it's kind of like in the workplace when we induct employees, we say, well, guess what? You're about to have this experience. Let's walk through it. Let's prepare you for it. Let's help you to know what to expect. What do you think you might do in this situation? How would you make a good decision here, a safe or a healthy decision, the, the right decision for you and for the organisation? We call it induction, right? And we've done that with our children through the years to help them to be prepared for the, the values-based challenges that they might have as they get older. And so I said, do we need to revisit the rules? She looked at me and said, Dad, I know why we have the rules. I've been part of the conversations, remember? I said, oh, okay. I said, I want to ask you a tough question. You're nearly an adult. You're a year and a bit off being an adult. Now, I think these are good rules, but do we need to rethink the rules? And then I waited and my heart pounded. <laughs> and eventually she said, Dad, I don't like the rules. And my heart stopped. <laughs> And I said, oh. <laughs> and I started to think of how to respond. And as I was thinking, she jumped in and added something else for me. She said, right now, Dad, I don't like the rules one little bit. But they're good rules. I think we should keep them. This is the kind of line that every parent dreams of hearing from their kids. <laughs> The heavens opened and the angels started singing and I just wanted to hug her. I was like, yes, because this, this kind of a statement from an employee or a team member or a family member, whoever it is, signifies that in spite of grumbles and groans and discontent, that, that there's, a, there's a level of buy-in and a level of commitment to the cause. And you know how you get it? You, if you paid attention to the story, you don't get it by saying, well, damn it, they're good rules and I expect that you will keep them. That's part of being in this family. That's called control. And that's not how we get to this point. Instead, we get it through this thing called autonomy. And research tells us that there are four principles that underpin really effective autonomy. And these are them. The first is that we've got to explain the why. You'll note that I spent 10 years explaining the why. So when it got to that moment where it mattered, she was ready and she understood and she was committed and she bought in because she'd been part of the process. Explain the why. I'm fortunate to to do some work with the Alana and Madeline Foundation based out of Melbourne. For those of you unfamiliar with the foundation, the foundation was started by a wonderful man called Walter Mickack. Along with dozens of others, Walter was deeply, profoundly and tragically affected 20 years ago when a tragedy occurred at Port Arthur and his wife and his two precious daughters, Alana and Madeline, were shot and killed and murdered. So he started that foundation to change the world for good. I walked into the foundation a little while ago and I noticed a sign on the door. And it was not the sign that it used to be. It used to say, please shut the door. But now the sign says this, please keep this door closed at all times as it regulates the air conditioning. Thank you. I said to Annie behind the the door, I said, you've changed changed the sign. Why did you do that? She said, no one used to close, close the door. I said, well, how's compliance now? She said, it's through the roof because there's a rationale. The second thing that we need to do is we need to see the world through their eyes. We cannot possibly support somebody unless we understand how life is for them. It's what I did for my baby girl. It's what Paul Sweeney did for me. It's what I tried to do for my teenage daughter. And again, I'll go back to that research. Paradoxically, the more entrenched we become in our leadership position, the harder it is for us to do this. We forget what it's like to be a struggling child or an employee that's got no idea what's going on and feels lost or is struggling with unfulfilled ambition. We need to see the world through their eyes and understand what it is that they're seeing so that we can respond accordingly. The third thing that we need to do is invite collaboration, initiative and problem solving. This is where we go from building the relationship to handing over our authority. 
to handing over our leadership and our power. We say things to our team or to our family like this, how can I help? Where to from here? What do you think? If you were in my position, what would you think was best? That's a powerful perspective-taking question to ask. What about this? How do, we, how do we move past this? And we start problem-solving. Research shows that when we go through this process, our kids are more likely to explore and be curious and be persistent and motivated. Teenagers make better decisions. And by the way, it works in workplaces as well. You might have heard of Zappos. Zappos is one of the world leaders in innovation in the workplace past couple of years, they've been flattening the structure, getting rid of the hierarchy, and going through these three steps. Not explained like this, but essentially the same three steps. Explaining, here's our mission, here's what we're trying to achieve. What do you think about this? How can we get there? Let's remove the obstacles and boundaries and help you as a team to get there. What can we problem solve around? What's your problem? Let's figure this out. What we're essentially doing is we're saying to the people who are around us, here's a ball. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take this ball represents the solution to the problem. I'm going to put the ball on the ground at your feet. And your job is just to kick the ball wherever you think that it should go. And we invite them to do that. We step back and we give them their autonomy. Now, they might kick the ball out of bounds. And if they do kick the ball out of bounds, we grab the ball back, we draw some lines and say, hey, nice kick, but that isn't probably going to get us where we need to go. So, if I give you the ball and let you kick it again, maybe we can keep it within the boundaries. Where would you like to kick it this time? That's autonomy support. That's what it's all about. Now, there's a fourth principle associated with that, and that is that we need to minimize the use of control. And the reason for that, pretty simple, force creates resistance. And what we do when we force is we push people into a box, and they want to get out of that box, and they just can't unless they start to resist us which causes problems. So principle number one, we show our power best by not showing it at all. And that's because number two, force creates resistance. The third thing that I want to share with you very briefly is about my nine-year-old daughter, Annie. We went rock climbing recently at an indoor rock climbing center and she hooked up to an auto belay. You hook your carabiner through your harness, the rope actually retracts through the roof so no one has to stand there and stop you from falling. She got to the top, she was hanging on like crazy. And she wouldn't let go, her arms were shaking, and she just didn't trust that the machine would catch her if she let go of the wall. I spent so long, Annie, come on, you can do this. I know it's really hard, I know you're scared, but you can do this. And eventually, after a lot of coaxing, she jumped. And the machine lowered her safely to the ground, and she laid on the ground and went, oh, and she felt safe, she felt great. Third principle. Eventually, we've got to let go. We've got to let our kids make decisions for themselves. We've got to let our team make decisions for themselves. We can't do it all for them. If we go with hard power, the coercion, the control, the cajoling, guess what? We've only got power while ever there's surveillance. But the soft power that comes out of this trust triangle allows us to have the one thing that every leader wants, and that is influence. Influence is the top of the triangle. Where do we get the influence from? Well, it comes from trust. Do they trust you enough? Because think about the people that you love in your life, the people that you absolutely trust in your life. They have huge influence, whether they're in the room with you or not. And how do we get that? Well, we go right back to the start. We get the relationship right with things like kindness and understanding and social and emotional awareness and being interested and showing our concern. Force creates resistance, but great relationships build autonomy, which allows us to leverage trust, which builds massive influence. Thank you.